Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Fusion Friday. My name is Alex Alvarez, Application Engineer here at Katib Technologies. Uh, so happy Friday, everyone. Hopefully, everyone has been having a, a great week so far. Um, ready for their four-day weekend, right? Enjoying some delicious barbecue with friends and family, because I know I am. Um, so anyways, for today, we are going to be talking about 3 plus 2 machining and simultaneous 5-axis machining, right? Uh, it's a common topic that that we normally get a lot here at T, um, and we wanted to kind of explain the differences and maybe show you guys something inside of Fusion 360 uh, that you guys may or may not have been aware of, right? So again, we are going to be recording this session for whatever reason. If you do need to, uh, you know, head out or you guys have something else coming up, um, where we are going to post it on YouTube. So be on the lookout for that. Um, or maybe I'm going too fast. You know, you you miss a couple steps there. So again. It's going to be recorded. Uh, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, and as well, also ask questions, right? So that's why we do these uh, webinars, just so that you know you guys can, can really gain some knowledge from these webinars. So ask any questions you may have, um, and I'll do my best to answer them at the end of the webinar. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward here. All right, so we have some learning objectives for today. Uh, like I mentioned, we are going to be talking about 3 plus 2, uh, which is normally referred to as positional. Right? And we'll kind of talk about why it's called positional uh, versus the simultaneous 5-axis toolpath. We're going to cover some of the toolpath selections inside of Fusion 360 as well. Um, and hopefully give you guys some, some sort of guidance on when you guys would use a specific toolpath. Then we're going to jump inside of Fusion 360. Again, program apart or two, and then kind of just show the workflow of how you would go about uh, programming the actual five axis part. And then finally, we're going to post that part out. Um, and we're going to dive a little bit into the post processor as well. Uh, not not too much, but we're going to show you guys exactly um, what's going on in the back end when you do post out uh, some sort of a five axis toolpath. All right, so first things first, uh, you guys will need Fusion Ultimate in order to access these five axis toolpaths, right? Um, if you guys have the, the student version, you guys already have the ultimate version of, of Fusion. Um, I believe the hobbyist version also comes with Fusion Ultimate, right? So um, if you're, you know, if you fall in one of those categories, uh, again, you do have Fusion Ultimate and you do have the four and fifth axis, axis capabilities. I have kind of a list here, kind of, uh, you know, showing the differences between the standard version and the ultimate version of Fusion 360. Really, the biggest differences are uh, so your fourth and fifth axis toolpaths and your simulation, right? So if you guys want to do some sort of advanced simulation, um, maybe do some shape optimization or, or even generative design, um, you do have capabilities to do that inside of Fusion Ultimate as well. All right, so we have the Fusion 360 toolpaths here. Uh, so you'll notice that when you hit the little drop down for the multi-axis toolpaths, you see these three toolpaths, right? So you have your swerve, your multi-axis contour, and your flow toolpath. Um, some people may not be aware, though, that the actual 3D drop down has a few um, actual fifth axis toolpaths, right? So the contour toolpath uh, is considered a multi-axis toolpath. Now, the way you access that, if you go into the uh, little edit dialog box, right, for the contour toolpath, you go to passes. Uh, somewhere in the middle, you have that option there, right? So you guys can see that on the bottom right. It says multi-axis tilting. Again, check that box, and you are going to enable the, the full five-axis capabilities for the 3D contour toolpath. All right, so we also have... What we have what we call the beta mode for Fusion 360. Um, again, if you hit the drop down for the 3D toolpaths, some of you may not see the blend toolpath, and that's again because it's still you know being tested, it's still being developed, um, but you can access it as of right now. Uh, we'll kind of walk through how you know how you can access the beta mode of, of Fusion 360. Uh, but again, you do have some some new functionality when you do access you know that that specific. Uh, mode inside of Fusion 360. One of them being you do get the blend toolpath. The other one is uh, you can actually lock the swarf toolpath. So instead of a full five axis toolpath, um, again, if you have only fourth uh, axis capabilities, 
you can lock one of the axes and then it'll just become a true fourth axis soul path, right? Um, so again, if you guys did want to access uh, the beta mode inside of Fusion 360, I uh, just type cam.beta mode forward slash on, and then that turns it, turns it on. Right? So let's go ahead and jump into Fusion 360, uh, see how we would program some of these, these parts here. All right, so starting off, uh, again, we take advantage of really the, the CAD CAM uh, capability inside of Fusion, right? So again, especially when, when you're working with fifth axis toolpaths, um, it, it can be a little bit difficult to visualize what's going to be happening when your part's in the machine, right? Um, so as of right now, we don't have uh, machine simulation. But what you can do, though, is just model your, your work holding in there, right? So again, if you have some sort of, of un, you know, unexpected movement, you're actually going to see the either the holder or the tool collide with your jaws or your your, your vice that you have down here. Um, again, we don't have the the machine uh, simulation as of right now, but hopefully in the future that's something that does get incorporated into Fusion 360. Um, we do get a lot of questions where people you know they try to create some sort of an assembly inside the, the CAM environment. Um, so that's one important thing to know is that. Assemblies are only going to be, you know, possible through the model workspace, right? So, again, you hit the drop down, you can switch between all these different workspaces here. Uh, again, if you do want to create this assembly or a, an assembly of any type, just go to the model uh, workspace and then begin creating your assembly uh, constraints there or joints. Uh, before we do get started, though, if we go to your your uh, your main data panel. Right, so this is where you store all your projects. We scroll down here. You'll see that we have the CAM samples project. Right, so uh, again, just feel free to to uh, to look through it. We do have this folder called work holding. So if you click on that work holding folder, you see that we have a couple of different work holding options. Right, um, again for the the Haas people, if you guys have a you know a UMC machine, just click on the fifth axis work holding, um, and you have you know some of the the uh, work holdings that they offer. All right, so extremely helpful. What you can do from here is you can save it or you can open it inside of Fusion 360 uh, and then save that specific uh, vice to your project and then create some sort of a template from it, right? So instead of having to go to the CAM samples every single time you want to bring it in, uh, just have it stored in your specific project and then just add it to each individual uh, model there, right? So. The, the piece that we're working with here today is under the, the CAM sample. So if for, for whatever reason you guys want to follow along or, or uh, you know, maybe down the line you guys want to see exactly how I did it, um, it is going to be inside the CAM samples, and it's the intro to 3 plus 2 milling. All right, so we're first going to look at the 3 plus 2, uh, or also known as the positional, right? So it's called positional for a couple reasons. Um, again, you you know you once you want to machine one of these pockets, what you do or what the machine does is it it rotates it gets perfectly perpendicular to your tool axis, right? So in this case, this face is going to be facing up, um, and then the tool is going to come down. It's going to machine. The part's probably going to rotate right to a different position. Let's say this other pocket. Again, the pocket's going to get perfectly perpendicular to the tool axis, and then it's going to machine that specific pocket, right? So again, it's only doing, um, it's it's only getting into its position prior to machining the actual feature on the part. Um, whereas, you know, something that's uh, simultaneous, where it requires the full five-axis um, capabilities or functionality of the machine to move. Um, in this case, it it doesn't require all of them to move simultaneously, right, or at the same time. Um, so that's why you know it's called positional or three plus two. Um, so again, now let's go ahead and, and program some of these these tool paths, right? So first things first, let's jump into the CAM workspace. All right, so we have a few tool paths here laid out just so that we can get to the to the meat of this webinar. Uh, I will say though that the the most important um, I guess process or, or step is gonna, going to be how you control your setup, right? So. Um, especially once you start getting into into fifth axis work, uh, your setup starts becoming extremely crucial because now you have to worry about okay, how am I going to rotate, or how's the part going to be rotating um, inside the machine, right? That's something that you kind of had to visualize and and you know kind of foresee as you you begin your setup. 
Um, so in this case, uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to use the UMC 750, right? So it has a B and C axis. Um, and in this case, the B axis rotates around the Y axis. And then the C axis or the C rotation rotates around the Z axis here, right? So let me go ahead and pull up a picture real quick. Um, let's see if we can clean this up over here. Right, so this kind of explains what's going on, right? So again, you have your X, Y, Z, um, and then the rotation is what gives you essentially the other two um, degrees of freedom, right? So again, we have the B axis, uh, the B rotation, and then the, the C rotation along the Z axis. Now that may not always be the case, right? Especially if you have, you know, some sort of a, of a trunnion, maybe it rotates around the X axis. Um, so in this case, again, you have to keep in mind how you want to position your part um, for your initial for your initial setup. All right, so going into back to this part again, we have the y-axis going this way, so the part's going to rotate like this around the y-axis, and then it has the full 360 degrees of, of rotation along the z-axis there. All right, so let me just do a quick simulation here just to see what's going on. Um, again, you have the option to turn on the stock. And again, it gets a little cluttered here with all these tool paths, right? So that's why I typically like to leave it to set to tail, right? So then that only shows me um, the actual portion of the tool path that has been uh, completed at that point, right? So you have the facing operation there. We can speed it up a little bit. All right, so we pretty much have all the top portion of it, right? So now let's go ahead and focus a little bit on the the pockets over here on the sides. Um, so for this, a lot of people, especially coming from, from Mastercam or some sort of other CAM software, uh, they're used to either creating some sort of reference planes, uh, maybe even a, you know, a reference axis that they have to specify which direction their tool is going to be pointing in or a, you know, machining in that specific direction. Uh, in this case, though, it's, it's going to be pretty simple, right? So again, we want to go ahead and do some sort of a 2D pocket operation. Let's go ahead and do that 2D pocket. Uh, I'm going to say that I want to start off with the pocket down here on the bottom left, right? So again, I'm happy with this tool selection. Next tab over is going to be the geometry tab, right? Um, and if you notice, right, so let's say typical workflow for a 2D tool path is just selecting that pocket there. All right, so let's take a closer look at what's happening. Notice that we still have that original word coordinate system, right? So we have our X, Y plane going this way. Um, and that's exactly what's going on here, right? So that loop or that contour that we selected is getting projected to that X, Y plane. So in this case, what we need to do, and again, if you guys have Fusion Ultimate, you, you'll see this little tool orientation checkbox on the bottom, right? Go ahead and check tool orientation. So once we check that, it's asking for a z-axis. In this case, I can go ahead and select a face. Again, selecting a face that's perpendicular to our tool. In this case, it's going to be this face right here. Right, And then people get pretty hung up, too, on, on the x and y direction. Right, So I just typically like to keep it in the same or, or relatively in the same direction that I have my original word coordinate system set up as. Uh, so I just flipped it around. Right, so now take a look at what's happening, right? So now our X, Y plane got repositioned and we have the correct, uh, essentially, preview of the, the contour that we're going to machine or the pocket that we're going to be machining, right? So in this case, uh, if we go ahead and just click OK, it gives us that five axis or, or three plus two positional tool path, right? Um, and again, we can go back into the heights tab here, make a few edits. Uh, so instead of being the stock top, we can do it from a selection, right? Because we already machined this space here. Click OK. So now it starts from a lower point, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, and again, this is probably a, a scenario where you want to take advantage of the derived operations, right? So essentially derived operations take into account all the settings or all the parameters that you have set for in this case, this specific toolpath, um, the only difference is that it, it's going to create, you know, that that other toolpath that you select or the derived operation that you that you intended to go for. 
Um, so in this case, I want to go ahead and and um, do a quick contour toolpath around the uh, the contour here, just to clean up the the edges or the face. Um, so again, I don't want to go to the 2D contour. Reselect my tool orientation. Uh, maybe even reselect my tool, right? So in this case, right click on the toolpath, create derived operation. What kind of operation is going to be a 2D milling? But now instead of a 2D pocket, it's going to be that 2D contour. Right, so if we take a look at what happened here, uh, if we go over to the geometry tab, notice that the tool orientation by default is already selected for us, right? Our heights, it automatically picked up that I selected that, that face for the, the previous operation, so it, it keeps that normal. So now all I really have to do is just click OK, and then it creates that contour toolpath, right? So it's pretty straightforward, pretty intuitive. Um, and again, it just saves, you know, a lot of time, especially if you, you know, you have multiple parts to program that entire day, um, just creates a lot of efficiency when going, going about this part, right? Uh, what you can do from here too is also duplicate the toolpath, right? So now I want to go ahead and focus on this other pocket here. So I can control D and that duplicates that specific toolpath, right? So I can drag and drop. Uh, tool paths as well, bring it down here, and it brings that pocket operation down here, right? So now this is our original 2D pocket. You have that 2D contour. So now all I really have to do is just edit that tool path. And like I mentioned, I want to go ahead and focus on this face right here. Now, typically what I like to do too is, is I don't like to select the chain first. I like to set my tool orientation prior to selecting the, the pocket, right? Sometimes you do get um, some, some weird selections when you select the pocket first. Um, so again, I, you know, I just like to keep that normal uh, to that pocket and then go in and select my pocket itself. Right, so notice that this time it's, again, keeping it normal to that pocket. Everything else is gonna be the same. Uh, and this has to change as well. So instead of that face, it's going to be this face. Go ahead and click OK. Right, so there's our pocket operation. Again, we can go back in here and create that derived operation for the uh, 2D contour and just select OK. So now we have these two pockets machined, right? So now what we can do then is uh, do some sort of a pattern for the, the specific toolpath. Uh, so in this case, what I can do is probably even do a circular pattern, right? So I can pattern this one so that it gets positioned over here. And then same thing for this pocket operation. Um, so let's go ahead and select all the tool paths that I want to pattern first. In this case, I want the 2D pocket here, the 2D contour, and the 2D pocket over here. Go ahead and select pattern. What kind of pattern is it going to be? It's going to be a circular pattern. My tool axis is going to be around that circular edge there. And we see that we get those pockets selected, right? So clicking OK. Again, let's go ahead and do a quick simulation of this so far. Um, simulate that. We already saw this. There's our contour. It repositions, right? Machines that other pocket and then it goes off to the other ones, right? So you guys can, can kind of see how easy it is to create positional tool pads, right? So it doesn't take a lot. Um, again, it doesn't, you don't have to spend a lot of time creating reference planes or, or creating an axis, right? Um, again, just work off of the geometry that you have already uh, to drive some of these some of these tool pads, right? So pretty straightforward. Um, and again, that was the, the three plus two positional tool pads, right? So now let's go over to some actual multi-axis toolpaths, right? So in the beginning, I did mention that the contour toolpath had the uh, the five-axis capabilities. Um, so again, I do have that contour toolpath here. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what this this specific toolpath is doing. Let's turn the stock off for right now. <clears throat> All right, so it's going to go in there, and then. It looks like it's machining it in, in both directions there, right? So again, that's probably not going to leave a, a great surface finish there. Um, and that's probably not something that we 
we want either, right? So let's go into the contour tool path. Um, and again, let's go ahead and, and enable those five axis capabilities. Um, so again, right click on the contour, edit. The first little option that I want to point out is the shaft and holder option, right? So again, in this case, it looks like the, the tool itself is gonna clear that, that cylindrical face. Um, but again, let's just go ahead and, and check it just for right now and, and see what happens, right? So again, the shaft and holder, what essentially happens when you check it on is the software itself looks at the tool, right? So essentially the, the tool length, and if it can't reach some sort of, a, you know, maybe this little fillet down here, um, depending on which option you select, right? So it's either gonna trim it, it's either it's gonna pull away from that surface, um, or it's just gonna fail altogether, right? So you have a couple options when uh, working with the shaft and holder. Again, I typically like to keep it at trim, um, just because you know I can see exactly where it's gonna fail. Maybe I can I have the the ability or I have the options to edit the model, um, and I can just go back in there and edit the model, right? Uh, so again, we're gonna check on shaft and holder, leave it at trim. Again, I'm gonna keep this out of the box too. Next option I want to select is under the passes. So again, with the Fusion Ultimate, you do get the multi-axis tilting, right? So let's go ahead and check that on as well. Um, and then you already have some, you know, out of the box uh, values. Again, I just hit OK. And then if the tool path fails or, or something happens, then that's where you can go back in there and make some edits, right? Um, what I find a lot of people doing is that they begin changing all these parameters, and then when the toolpath fails, they don't know exactly which parameter you know caused that error, because again, they just made so many changes, right? So in this case, I just turned on the shaft and holder. Um, I turned on the multi-axis tilting, and I'm just gonna go ahead and select okay. So again, these toolpaths do take a little bit longer, right? So again, if you guys are, are someone who you know constantly goes back and forth between the model and the cam environment, um, what you can do there is just right click on it, protect the toolpath, and then that way you don't have to load or generate that toolpath every time you make a, a slight change, right? Um, so as of right now, it looks like it has a, a couple retracts, right? But right away you can tell that it got you know got rid of, of the back and forth motion. So let's go ahead and simulate, see what's going on. Right. So right off the bat, you can see that it took into account that five degree tilt that we had, right? So again, if we slow it down a little bit. Okay, so it's starting off starting off good. So now it's going to go all the way back. And it's going to go around that little fillet there, right? So again, it's not going to machine this little portion here. Um, and I mean, that's for my case, that's going to be okay. Uh, what I can do here is use a pencil tool path, right? And then follow that, that fillet all the way around the, the model, right? Um, but I just wanted to show you guys that the you know the the 3D toolpath or the 3D contour does have those multi-axis capabilities, right? Um, now in the future, I believe it's it's, it's going to be Autodesk. Um, you know, it's 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 in their vision, in their in their their timeline, I believe, to actually enable those capabilities for a few of these toolpaths, right? So as of right now, the contour toolpath is the only one that has uh, those multi-axis capabilities. Um, but again, Autodesk does hope to have you know those the, the multi-axis tilting um, for some of these other toolpaths in here. Um, so while we're looking at the 3D toolpaths here as well, um, one other toolpath that you guys don't see here is the the blend toolpath, right? So let's go ahead and turn on the beta mode. Um, and the the way you go about that is you go to File, View. And then you have the show text commands here, right? So you can go ahead and click show text commands. Notice that I've been playing playing with it a little bit, right? So what I'd like to do is just copy that cam.beta mode, save some time here, forward slash on, right? So it tells you cam.beta mode is on now. So now if we go into the 3D dropdown, notice that I have that blend tool path already, right? So again, um, it's, it's blend is a five axis tool path, but again, you have to go ahead and, and go into the passes and then enable that use multi-axis capabilities, right? Um, same thing with flow. So flow is under the multi-axis uh, dropdown, but if you hit the dropdown, 
notice that it has that use multi-axis capability as well. Right, so that was a contour toolpath. Let me go over to our next example. Right, so do a quick simulation. Uh, not post process. Simulate. Turn on the stock. Let's see what we have going on so far. Uh, fast forward this. All right, so we pretty much have it done. Uh, the only few things that we need to take care of are the surface over here on the top, and the chamfer over here right so again you could probably use some sort of a, of a you know chamfer mill to get take this taken care of but again as it goes down into the curves it might not give us that that nice surface finish um so why not just go ahead and use one of the tools that we had right so we do have the full the five axis capabilities so let's go ahead and take advantage of that um i'm gonna go ahead and use that same tool here so for this i'm gonna go ahead and use that swarf toolpath Go ahead and select that. Again, I'm going to be okay with that tool. Let's go to geometry. Uh, so you have a couple of ways that you can drive this toolpath, right? So you can drive it based off of contours, or you can do it based off of surfaces. Now, personally, in my opinion, I find that contours is elite, uh, it's just easier to, to handle. Um, you can really manipulate the toolpath a little bit more, and it just makes makes the most sense, in my opinion, right? So again, if you go to selection mode, contour pairs. Um, it's going to be pretty important to what you select first when it comes to contours, right? So if you guys take a look at the picture there that, that's coming up, um, you'll notice that the bottom chain, right? So one of them is blue and then one of them is yellow. Um, so the blue one is always going to be the, think of it as the bottom portion of the tool, right? So that's what's going to tell the software, hey, the this is the, the direction that the tool is going to be heading in. Um, so this is the way I want my tool path to get generated. Right, so if I go contour pairs, right, so the first selection is always going to be where the bottom of the tool is going to be at, right? So in this case, I want the tool or the bottom of the tool to be in this direction, right? So notice that it turned blue there. Uh, and now to select the, the top of the tool or the, the top chain, just go ahead and click on that top one, right? So you don't have to really select anything or, or indicate that, hey, you know, I'm switching over to the, to the top chain now. Um, it automatically knows that there's the, the disconnection there, so it knows that these are two different chains. Um, and notice that as soon as I turn on that cam beta mode, I have that fourth axis limit. Right? So again, you can drive this based off of just four axis. Um, again, you have to turn on the, the beta mode though, right? Um, and then just lock out one of the, the axes there. All right, and really with the Swarf toolpath, this is what's so great about these, these toolpaths, right? You can just go ahead and, and click OK, and it gives you an actual true five-axis five, five axis toolpath, right? So we can go ahead and simulate this, turn off the stock, and you guys can start seeing, right? So the bottom, bottom edge of the tool is going along the bottom edge that we selected. Notice that it's lifting up there a little bit, right? So what we can do then for this toolpath is go back to that toolpath and have a tool offset, right? So in this case, maybe 200,000 is gonna be fine. Um, and again, everything else here is going to be okay, right? So if I did wanna do multiple passes, right? Or essentially a, another step over, um, you do have the ability to, to, to turn that on here, right? So let's go ahead and click okay. Oops. Positive offset, offset. Change that to two hundred thousandths. All right, and it brings that tool path a little bit below that selection there, right? So now, if we go ahead and run that simulation, notice that the bottom of the tool is clearing that that bottom edge there, right? All right, so now that covers the Swarf toolpath. Let's go over to the, the Flow toolpath, right? The Flow toolpath is gonna be taking care of this specific surface here. Now, the, this is a great example for when the Flow toolpath is going to is going to work, right? So you have some sort of surface, uh, you know, nice surface here that you just wanna follow with some sort of tilt. Um, and that's really where the, the Flow toolpath is gonna shine, right? So again, I'm gonna select this quarter inch ball um, and then just select the geometry for now, right? 
And again, keep in mind your, your machine axis, right? So again, it's gonna rotate around the B axis, right? So that's why I want the arrows, you know, left to right of the Y axis there. Um, and then if I go to passes though, you can change that, right? So whichever isometric direction, if you want it to go along the U or along the V, you do have that option to change that as well. Now, again, keep in mind that the five axis tool paths, right? Like I mentioned, they, they are pretty, pretty intensive when it comes to generating um, themselves, right? So uh, again, you may wanna start off with maybe 50 step overs, uh, maybe just find out that the tool path is gonna work correctly before actually you know, having some sort of a fine step over here. Click OK, and it creates that tool path, right? So one thing you guys will notice is that it's not five axis, right? It's still a, a 3D tool path, if you will. Um, so like I mentioned, the even though the flow tool path is under multi-axis, you do have to enable the true five axis capabilities, right? So if you go back to the tool path, select edit, right under passes, right? So it's still that same checkbox use multi-axis and let's have some sort of a small forward tilt, right? So again, this is gonna be your lead angle um, and this is gonna be your lag angle, angle, right? So I'm just gonna be okay with the lead angle of five degrees. And you'll see there that it gave us that nice tilt, right? So now if we go ahead and simulate that, You guys can kind of see what's going on, right? Something you could have done too for that initial collision is maybe do an offset surface and extend that a little bit, right? Maybe the radius of the tool. Um, and then that way it starts off a little bit past this edge here, right? Or maybe you can even you can even extend the, uh, the lead in for it um, and get that taken care of, right? So Again, that covers the swarf and the flow. Um, again, you guys do want to make sure that you uh, you enable the actual fifth axis uh, capabilities inside the, the flow tool path. Right? Uh, let me see if I can show the blend tool path real quick. Right. So let me go ahead and create just a, a quick sketch here of when you would probably use that that blend tool path. Uh, let's go somewhere on there. Shoot it. All right, so what I'm gonna be creating here is just a regular cylinder, right? So again, this this works if you have, you know, some sort of organic cylinder as well. Um, in this case, I'm just gonna keep it pretty simple. Create my setup. Again, this is just gonna be a relative size cylinder. Give me some material on the side. And go from there. All right, so let's see if we can, let's see if we can add a few tool paths to this, right? So let's see if we can start off with that Swarf tool path first. Um, so again, let's go ahead and use that Swarf tool path. Um, in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and select my tool. Let's see if we have half inch ball somewhere around here. Let me go ahead and select that from here. And again, take advantage of these, uh, these, these predefined tools already, right? Um, so I, I believe I saw an announcement either by Curtis Chan or, or someone from Autodesk. Um, they are partnering with another tool manufacturer. Um, so be on the lookout for that that really extensive tool library, right? That 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 tool manufacturer is going to have. Um, so again, we have the tool selected. Go back into the geometry, um, and again, based off of contours, right? Contour pairs. In this case, selecting the bottom contour, selecting the top contour here. Now, if we were to just click OK, let's take a look at what happens. Right, so it creates just that basic tool path there, right? So let's go back into the tool path, create a few edits. Um, we might even want shaft and holder to turn on. And let's go back into the passes. Right, so cutting mode, we don't want it to be a single pass. Um, in this case, we want to go from the top Let's do that. Um, and then let's see if we, I'll probably just keep it like that. Let's see how that looks. All right, so there's a tool path there. Uh, it doesn't look, doesn't look too bad, right? So we just wanna make sure that we play around at this point with the, 
the actual tilt itself, right? Because that's what's gonna that's what's gonna matter when we actually machine this part, right? So you can see right away that it is machining into it. So now let's go ahead and start adding a quick tilt to it, right? So in this case, I can add maybe a, I don't know, 15 degree tilt. Notice that it is gonna take a little bit longer as well. Okay. So again, we still have that same tool path, but notice at this time, we tilted the tool, right? So now the the the, uh, the holder isn't going to collide with the actual part itself. Um, so at this point, let me go ahead and, and see if I can use that same concept for the blend tool path. All right, so I can go ahead and use a blend. We're going to be using that same tool. Uh, the drive surfaces, in this case, is going to be the surface here. And then the curves are going to be these right here. All right, so let's go ahead see what's going on there. All right, so we want to use multi-axis. Um, in this case, let's say maybe a 10 degree tilt. In this case, step over is going to be fine. Uh, let's see if that gives us anything, actually. All right, so give us something. But again, it's not exactly perfect, right? So let's go back into that blend tool path and turn on shaft and holder. Right, so we want to be trimmed for that. Um, and then take off the forward tilt, right? So I'm going to take that off. I'm going to do a smaller step over in this case. So point one, um, the direction. In this case, I want to go in one way because I noticed that it was trying to machine in, in both directions there as well. Uh, and that should be it for this one, right? So retraction policy, minimum retraction. And then again, give it some sort of an arbitrary value, right, for maximum stay down. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to stay down for those 30 inches. Um, but again, if if it doesn't need to come up in those 30 inches, then it's going to it's going to want to stay down, right? So right off the bat, um, it looks much nicer, right? So let's go ahead and simulate this. Let's see how that looks. And that's one thing that I want you guys to, to keep in mind too, right? It, I mean, in the beginning, the the blend tool path was was pretty scary, right? And that's what scares a lot of people when it comes to either 3D or, or the actual multi-axis tool paths is, you know, they, they originally see the tool path and they just start freaking out and they're like, well, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not working for me. Um, but just take it one step at a time. Again, don't go into the, the tool path itself and make all these changes. Um, just make it pretty simple, make a few changes at a time and then start figuring out, you know, what works and then and, and what doesn't. Um, so again, that's the blend toolpath. Again, this is a, a pretty good scenario of where you would use it. Um, you can even use that swarf toolpath and then block the the uh, the fifth axis, right? So then it becomes an actual fourth axis fourth axis toolpath. Um, so you do have some some capabilities when it comes to you know locking some of these these axes. All right, so now let's go into actually posting out this part, right? So again, we have that toolpath. Um, let's go ahead and post process. Uh, we're going to use that UMC 750. It's going to be fine with me. Post it out. Desktop. Save it. Yes. Let's see. Rewind the machine. Let's save it. Oh, okay. So let's see. Let me go back to this one right here. Let's see if this one. I believe I had edited the rewind for it. Yeah. Okay. So that was the issue there. All right. So let me go ahead and post this real Swarf tool path real quick. Okay. And there it is. All right. So let's take a look at the, the code a little bit, right? So you can see that it is actually a five axis tool path, right? So we start seeing the B axis rotation and the C axis, right? And then if you come down here, you'll notice that, again, all five axes, right, are going to be working simultaneously at the same time, right? So X, Y, Z, and then, of course, your two rotation um, axes there as well. Uh, so let's see. Let me go ahead and go into the post real quick. Uh, so again, it was a BC toolpath, right? If we go into the post process, open config, Notice that line 369, right? So if true, 
and then it's pointing out that it has the BC axis enabled, right? So now this is again for the Haas UMC 750. If we go to the generic Haas post, right? So again, post process, go to your generic Haas here, open config. Notice that this one is, it, it has the lines of code essentially to give you the, the fifth axis um, commands or the code. Um, but that's something that you would have to come in here and set that up yourselves, right? Um, so again, if you set this to true, uh, you already have the variable A and B axis enabled. Um, but again, that th this will probably be for a, a Trunnion machine and there already is a post for the Trunnion, right? So that's one thing too, just make sure that you guys, that there's a post already, uh, especially on the forums there, you know, people are, are always helping each other out. Um, so I highly suggest you go to the HSM post forum, uh, figure out exactly if there's a post for your machine or not. Um, and if there isn't, sometimes some of these, these default posts can be a little bit manipulated, right? And then they can work for, for your guys' machines as well. Um, so if you take a look here, right? So you have the X axis, which is rotating the A here, right? And then the Z axis here, or the B. Uh, and then you have your your limits for the axis and then the preference, right? Whether you want it to be a negative, um, negative value or positive value for the axis. Uh, so let me go back into Fusion here. All right, so there's a few questions here. So I have Fusion as part of the product. Okay, yeah, so Robert's asking that he has the uh, product design and manufacturing collection. Um, but yeah, the product design and manufacturing collection, so for some reason it has HSM uh, Ultimate, uh, but when it comes to Fusion 360, it just has the standard the standard version, right? Um, so I will be doing actually an ABA on, I believe in October, that's gonna be pretty similar to this, um, and that's gonna be regarding to you know, HSM and inventor HSM, right? So again, we're gonna cover the, the same steps, the same process, um, and you guys will be pretty surprised on how, you know, how similar those two um, CAM components are, right? So again, HSM is built into Fusion 360, um, and again, it just allows for that user interface to be pretty consistent across, across the board for Autodesk products, right? But yeah, um, I do agree with you, Robert. It, it doesn't, doesn't really make sense for that point there. Uh, so yeah, pretty much covers what I had for today, right? So again, posting out the the actual tool paths. Um, hopefully, you guys, you know, saw a little bit on how you know a, a specific tool path works with a specific model. Um, and then, of course, we kind of dove into the the post processors uh, there towards the end, right? All right. So at this point, if you guys have uh, any questions, you guys can go ahead and, and ask away. All right, so we have a question here from Jay. He's asking, can you show the, the cam beta mode again? Yeah, so let me go back in here. Uh, so let me go into the file, right? So the, that's gonna be your first step, right? So you're gonna go into file, you're gonna go to view, and then for you, it's, it's probably gonna say show text commands. For me, I already have it enabled at the very bottom of my screen there. So I can go ahead and hide it. If I go to file, view now it's going to say show text commands right so notice if you hit Control alt c it is going to enable that show text commands as well right so you can do show text commands um if you don't see it pop up just hit that little plus sign on the bottom right and then again just do cam dot beta mode forward slash off right and it turns it off so now if i go to my 3d tool paths notice that the blend tool path isn't there all right and Adam's asking if uh, it stays on by default after you close fusion um, so no it doesn't right so every time you close fusion uh, it does automatically turn that that feature or that beta mode back off right so again if you do want that functionality just make sure that you go back in there um, you enable it again and then you're gonna have access to the, the blend toolpath there and a little bit more other functionality uh, but other than that, it doesn't seem like we have 
any more questions coming in again guys uh, i'm gonna put my email here if you guys have any more questions maybe you guys are trying out fusion 360 or uh, even inventor hsm right go ahead and then feel feel free to reach out um I'll, I'll be glad to answer some of your guys' questions um and we are going to have a survey at the end of the webinar as well so just let us know what you guys want to see next and we'll do our best to to try and accommodate that and and you know schedule those topics out for for the future um but with that hopefully you guys have a, a great uh four-day weekend labor day weekend right so again have a good one guys see you on the next one